Life in a Late Woodland Native American Village in Michigan, Part 3. So far in this series, we have looked at how people of the Late Woodland in Michigan dressed, how they made pottery, and a brief look at uh, other occupations, which I'll expand on in future installments. This time, though, I want to look at their woodworking skills. Back in 1990, the magazine Popular Woodworking carried an article of mine titled, Working Wood in the Age of Stone. I will use that as the basis for this video, and we'll read the article in its entirety in a, more towards the end of this. The late wood, woodland period in Michigan dates from 500 to 1400 years ago, and a great deal of woodworking was done by these Native Americans, but few examples remain because, of course, the wood has long since rotted away. Though the coming of the Europeans ruined the Native American culture for selfish European causes, we can thank them for one thing. They left a written legacy of what life was like here in the Great Lakes region, and without that we would have little knowledge of, of um, the occupations and pursuits of these wonderful people. Besides the written record, we can also learn a great deal by the stone tools they made. On woodland sites, axes, both grooved and ungrooved, are common. Also found are chisels, gouges, flint blades, scrapers, stone spokeshaves, and the adze, as well as an abundance of stone drills. Wood was employed in the building of their lodges, fences, platforms, palisades. It was used for making bows, spears, and arrow shafts, as well as dugout canoes, and was the raw material for basket making. Wood was used for masks, totems, effigies, and, uh, and bowls, plus likely hundreds of other uses that we don't even know at this point. Um, and there, were, there were also war clubs, cradle boards for babies. Let's begin with the dugout canoe. They were the common mode of transportation and were used more than the much romanticized white bark uh, canoe, white birch bark canoe. Actually, several partial examples of the dugouts have been found near Cedar Lake um, by Oscoda, Michigan. That they survived at all is because they had become encased in muck, which sealed off the bacteria, causing decay, at least in part. One of um, the dearest friends I ever had was Jerry Wagner, who had a great talent for, and love for recreating wooden relics using the same tools and methods the Native Americans used. I was at his private museum off F41 as he showed me a dugout canoe that he had made and explained the process to me. Jerry had felled the tree, cedar I believe, using a stone axe as the Indians would do. As, and as they would do, he burned into the standing tree and then chopped away the burnt wood, continuing this process over and over until the tree came down. The process alone took a great deal of patience and time. And remember, even starting the fire was a job that probably none of us watching this video could do without a pocket lighter or a pack of matches. Once the tree was down, fire was used again, burning into the log and chipping away the, the burned wood to form the hollow <coughs> with finishing work done with an, with an adze, again stone and again on a wooden handle. Jerry, as I recall, said it took maybe 40 to 45 hours to complete, which was really a good investment for the Native American traveler. With care, he would have transport that might last 20 plus years. Compare that to the worker today. How long do we struggle at work for a vehicle that might never be paid for, trade it off as it starts to fall apart, a money pit of repairs, gas, and insurance? Yes, in some ways, the late woodland dwellers were much smarter than we are today, plus the dugout canoe did not pollute the environment. The birch bark canoe <clears throat> that most of us think of in connection with um, the Native Americans was also a product of the ancient woodworker. A lightweight and durable conveyance indeed, though unlike the dugout, was susceptible to puncture. W.B. Hinsdale pointed out in his book, The First People of Michigan, that the production of the birch bark canoes was limited to the territory where the white birch tree grows sufficient in size for the purpose. He also pointed out that the bark of a few other trees was used for the purpose also. According to him, bark from some hickories made excellent canoes. Also, elm was uh, said to be used at times. I'd like to quote the following from Mr. Hindale's book. The graceful specimens so shapely and trim one sees now are only a resemblance of the prototype made with stone tools and whatever other carpenter's implements the maker had devised. A knife and draw shave made of flint, 
a clamshell for finishing tools, a stone hatchet and a few perforators made of bone and antler, which were used as gimlets, could not have en <coughs> enabled the workmen to produce more than a clumsy but nonetheless usable conveyance. Never mind the appearance, it is the invention and uh, not the detail that testifies to the ingenuity of primitive man. Hinsdale used the word primitive, not me, for I in no wise view these woodland people as any more primitive than we are today. There is another device used in the navigation of the waters that also was produced by the woodland worker, and that, of course, was the paddle. Without this, they would have been, well, up the creek without a, well, you get the picture. Of the dugout, it was not even it was not enough to know how to craft the wood, but also how to care for the finished product over the years. When not in use, these crafts would season, and they would dry, they dry out, crack, and shrink. They had an, a method to avoid this. To avoid this, if the dugout was to not be in use for an extended period, it would be submerged in the water or buried in wet sand. Uh, another thing that uh, Mr. Wagner had pointed out to me that with care these uh, late woodlanders had a vehicle that once completed might last them 20-30 years um, in comparison to the investment in time we put into a vehicle today for a couple years um, we don't get a good deal compared to them stopping here about the canoes and dugouts gives an incomplete picture though in another installment, we will look at the waterways and trails that made up the ancient transportation system of the Native American people. And here's a little teaser. We will, in the next vi in in the future video, take a look at a stone from Oscoda's Olvernetton Creek, which may be one of Michigan's earliest surviving maps. As we have seen already, the late woodland carpenter was busy indeed. His job began with making his own tools. There had to be uh, wooden and sometimes bone handles for the cutting devices to be set into. In looking at a superb collection of wooden reproductions Jerry Wagner had recreated, just as the originals were made, I had access to peeking back at a toolkit of the late woodland carpenter. Just as they would have done, Mr. Wagner sought out just the right branch formation in which to set the adze and the axe. The same was true of the draw knife, with its razor-sharp flint blade set into the section of branch. Hammer stones and axes were hafted onto wooden handles. Nearly every manual woodworking tool we have today, they had, including flint drills, expertly napped in the same technique that was used to produce the arrowheads. Hunting would have been near impossible without the carpenter as he made the arrow and the spear shafts, as well as the bow. He knew how to... Uh, how to heat the shafts and bend them just right so they would so that they would be straight and of course the carpenter needed to know just the right wood types to make the uh, the bow from which uh, the arrow would be fired with deadly precision choice of materials and the design of the arrows was not random humidity affects wooden um, bows the indians used a variety of materials to make the bow stave one of the most important requirements was the wood being flexible without breaking Ash, hickory, cedar, walnut, and birch were all good choices and were readily available to the late woodland Indians of Michigan. The arrow shafts were made from the shoots uh, from shoots such as dogwood, ash, birch, and such. The string, of course, would have been of sinew and possibly woven plant fiber. Woodworking was an, es was an essential in many aspects of late woodland life. We have already discussed in part two that bowls and pots were made from clay and bark containers were common also. But again, from early contact period documents, we know carved wooden bowls were also widely used. These uh, were bowls that would have been much larger than those made of clay, and because of the size and use would have had to have been much more durable. They were expertly carved. Other items uh, that were employed, employed wood included totem symbols and, and uh, <clears throat> drums, which were very much a part of the American Indian way of life. Um, I'd like to uh, to now go to the article that appeared in Popular Woodworking Magazine in September of 1990, and again that was titled Working Wood in the Age of Stone. When we consider the prehistoric peoples of the Americas, we naturally tend to think of the beautiful stone artifacts on display in museums and private collections. And why not? After all, this period before writing is generally known as the Stone Age. 
Nonetheless, when the Europeans first made contact with the Indians, they found that wooden implements were as abundant as stone ones. We have few prehistoric wood relics today, of course, because untreated wood does not stand up well to the ravages of time. A few examples of Native American wor woodworking have survived, oh, one not far from where I live. From out of the muck along the uh, along Cedar Lake, near Oscoda, Michigan, was pulled a dugout canoe, but such relics are few and far between. Many of the stone tools recovered by archaeologists are directly related to woodworking. Let's take a look at these stone woodworking tools and some of the woodworking duties that occupied the American Indians. The basic tool was the axe or celt, the difference being that the axe is grooved in order to attach to the handle, while the celt is not. Um, <clears throat> axes are grooved in several ways. In some, the, grooves, the groove runs all the way around the stone, while others show a three-quarter groove or half groove. Celts are easier to make and more abundant than grooved axe. Uh, but the manufacture of any stone tool is complicated and a difficult endeavor, requiring skill developed through considerable practice. Most axes are single-bitted, although double-bitted ones have been found and some are fluted and barbed. Prehistoric peoples also made ceremonial axes, which were quite often elaborate and intended for burial inclusion. Felling a tree with a stone axe or salt was a laborious undertaking. The most common method was to build a fire around the base of the tree and burn into it as far as possible. Then an axe was used to chop away the carbonized wood. The process was repeated over and over until the tree was downed. When planks were required, stone or wood wedges were used to split what was needed off the trunk. Another important tool in the Indian woodworking was the stone drill, generally made of chert and either straight or T-shaped, and they were set into wooden shafts and spun by hand or by the use of a bow. The adze, usually hefted in wood from the crotch of a tree, was essentially, in many Native American tribes, um, <coughs> to make, it was essential in many Ameri Native American tribes. It was especially useful in carving dugout canoes. The method was similar to felling the tree. The maker burned into the log and carved away the charred wood. Native Americans made many fine small items of wood. Wooden spoons were common, as were bowls, face masks, and in some areas, totem poles. While the rough forms could be worked out with the axe or adze, something akin to a knife was needed to fine-tune them. The waste slivers from the chipping of flint... Uh, and flaking of arrowhead production provided a rich source of carving and whittling blades. If you've ever excavated at an archaeological site where chert had been worked, you probably sliced your hands more than once on the razor-sharp debitage. The, piece, the pieces flake off in all sizes and are ideal for wood carving. An important use for wood was in the making of arrow shafts. The uh, photo above right shows a notched tool um, used to smooth shafts. The Indians also made and used stone wrenches for straightening shafts, and sometimes these tools were worn as personal ornamentation. Some tribes fashioned war clubs, fish hooks, bows, baby carrying boards, and even pipe stems from wood. Another important use of wood in the Stone Age was structural. The small tree felled and employed as poles in the great variety of Native American homes. Basket making was very much a woodworking art. John and Sue Naganigan, who uh, Native Americans who make baskets in the old way, began by felling the black ash tree by cutting into it, um, at cutting it into measurable lengths. The wood is then beat with a hammer, stone in the ancient times, until the annual growth rings can be separated and cut into strips. After they have dried, the strips are split into thinner strips, which are then woven into sturdy baskets. We've just scratched the surface of an immense subject, and the purpose of this video is not to be all comprehensive, but just to give a basic idea as to what life was like in a <coughs> late woodland Native American Indian village in Michigan.